Sunday was the final day of Terrificon. I went up, I figured I'd pick up a couple of books. And so I picked up, you know, a couple of books, including a big grail for me that completes a huge run for me. Up next on this video from Bronzeville Comics. Hey there, comic book community. This is Jim from Bronzeville Comics coming to you with another video. And um, if you like the content of this channel, like, comment, subscribe, do all that great stuff. I would really appreciate it. Um, also follow us on Instagram at Bronzeville underscore comics. I'm on whatnot, Bronzeville underscore comics. I do whatnot sales every Monday night at 10 p.m. Eastern time on August 8th, Monday night, just after the series premieres, we're going to have a Sandman night. Um, so uh, mark those, uh, go follow us on whatnot, uh, bookmark the shows. Also in the description below is um, a link to my eBay store. So um, I couldn't get to um, Terrificon up in Mohegan Sun in Connecticut on Either Friday or Saturday is a three-day show. It's one of the biggest shows in the Northeast. Uh, and I finally had the opportunity to go on Sunday. So it was about a two-hour drive for me. I went up, figured, spend a little bit of time there, spend a little bit of money, maybe look for a couple of books that are on my list. Um, and I ended up going in a little bit different direction, picking up some really cool stuff. I did some digging, ran into so many members of the community. They were either selling their setup or were there uh, buying. It was really a, a great experience. Now, I do have to give a shout out to Three Men in the Basement. Otto and Roger were there, and I won one of their giveaways. And I got these two books, Thor, God of Thunder 1 and 6. I did not collect this run, so it's pretty cool to get that. It's on Ribic was at the... Um, at the show, but I'm not, generally speaking, a big autograph guy, so I didn't get those signed. I did, as you'll see later, I did get um, a couple of autographs, which is a little bit unusual for me. I wasn't planning on spending a lot of time diving into the um, the bins, the one, three, five dollar bins, and for the first part of the show, I kind of didn't. I was looking more for books to fill in a, a couple of runs for me. But I went to the bins. I was actually looking at a lot of the wall books, and there were a couple of books I've been looking for that, that weren't there. Um, so this book I actually got for a dollar. Um, a Tarzan 100-page Super Spectacular, number 235. So that was really cool to get for a buck. It looks to be in pretty decent shape. Also, uh, there were a bunch of lesser-known titles. Uh, DC Bronze Age, I picked up this. Black Hawk number 247 because I'm collecting these all the books from uh, July of 1976 where DC had this banner just a part of my childhood that I remember so I figured that'd be cool to pick up um, I think these were in a $2 bin um, you know, the price stickers don't really matter picked up this um, I picked up a number of the copies of this this is the first appearance 52 number 7 first appearance of Kate Kane she becomes Batwoman in issue 11 I believe um, and they did cancel the Batwoman series on the CW. Kate Kane been off that since the actress Ruby Rose left. I think that we're going to eventually see Kate Kane Batwoman in something related to the Batman movie directed by Matt Reeves and some of the spinoffs that we're going to be seeing on HBO Max. That's just my theory. I picked this up because I've heard a lot of good things about this series, Silver Coin. This is a, um, an image uh, series from, I think, last year. Picked up number one. Again, this was not a sticker price. This, I think, was two bucks. Um, Omega Men number five. This is the second appearance of Lobo. Uh, got here just you know a couple of um, Frank Miller Daredevils. So that's always good to have, and they may see those in my Daredevil sale. I picked these two books up. I'm almost finished. I, I don't even know if I have the original run. Um, I bought a collection that had 
um, like maybe six or seven of these issues. I picked up one recently. This was a book I was really happy to find. I think it was this. This might have been in a $5 bin. Uh, this amazing Sienkiewicz cover, Electra Assassin number one. This may be available at Daredevil Sale. Um, classic X-Men number three. Uh, just picked it up because it has that picture frame anniversary cover. Another Miller Daredevil. The issue after Electra dies. A newsstand. That was pretty cool. I picked this up for five bucks, I think. Um, Iron Man 219, the first appearance of G the Ghost. Uh, the Ghost, of course, we saw in Ant-Man uh, and the Wasp. Uh, some rumors that we're going to see that character again in Quantumania and quite possibly as part of the Thunderbolts. There's some speculation. So that was a pretty crispy copy of that book. Um, just I was trying to get to like some even numbers. I picked this up. I think this was in a $2 bid. Um, this Frank Miller cover. I don't know if I had gotten all these covers of Detective Comics 1000. I probably had this, but Batgirl number one, Rebirth, that's pretty cool. This book is a book that always has some value. I think, again, this was in a $2 bin. These Marvel Milestone Editions, X-Men number one. This was either a dollar or two. I had picked up the rest of the series. And this is a variant cover, but I had picked up issues 2 through 12 of this at a flea market so or an antique store, so I decided to finish it off. This, polybagged, um, Ghost Rider 31, the first full appearance of the Midnight Suns. Then, some fantastic four keys. This is uh, 245, and these are all newsstands, which is for 60 cent issues is a little bit harder to find. This is the first time we see Franklin Richards as an adult. Um, he goes by the name Avatar, and of course, we're seeing uh, that in, adapted in a film by James Cameron. What? No? No, that's a different Avatar. Okay. So we see this in a, um, an anime. No, that's not. That's another Avatar. Okay. Yeah. So it's just Avatar that we see um, Franklin Richards as. So I know. Um, Joe from 360 Comics has been speculating on this book, so that kind of got under uh, way from under his nose. And again, Fantastic Four, this classic Doctor Doom cover in issue 258. And Doctor Doom is Doctor Doom. Um, 272, the first cameo appearance of Nathaniel Richards, who um, does have a connection to, to Kang and Rama Tut and the Mortis and all that fun stuff. And then 273, the first full appearance of uh, Franklin Richards, all these newsstands, and those are pretty nice copies. Um, I saw this. This was these were on the five dollar bin. Uh, this Silver Surfer number one, this one shot does have some spine ticks on it, but still, um, this is uh, I think Stan Lee wrote this, if I'm not mistaken, and John Byrd did the art. So um, one shot, I thought that was a good pickup. Detective Comics six forty seven, the first appearance of Stephanie Brown, the spoiler. Um, she also at different times was a Robin and a Batgirl, but she's a daughter of the uh, villain, the Clue Master, and for the most part, she's a spoiler, kind of, uh, has been associated with Tim Drake as a partner, as a romantic interest over the years. Um, another Miller Daredevil, Miller Daredevil, earlier Miller Daredevil. I mean, these were, if you get these for five bucks or less, you can't say no. Another Another book I couldn't say no. Um, and it was in pretty solid shape. It's not bagged or boarded. But this is not bad at all. Swamp Thing number four. Bernie Wrightson cover and art. That is, that's a that's actually a nice copy. 1973. Um, this might have been like a two buck. Legends number one. First appearance of Amanda Waller. Um, what's the latest on Amanda Waller? Uh, we're going to see more of her in Black Adam, I believe. I think that's the latest news that we're going to see her in Black Adam. Um, I think if Warner Brothers Discovery does anything smart, you have one of the best actresses working today, Viola Davis, playing Amanda Waller. Lock that down. Get her in as many properties as possible. Um, it's quite possible she might be kind of... The DC Universe answer to Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury. Um, then I picked up Why Not? Sleepwalker number one. Another Why Not? Wonder Man number one. Newsstand. Does have the poster. That's been a hot book. Um, picked this up for five bucks. Star Slayer. I have so many of these. Star Slayer number 10. It's the first appearance of Grimjack. And if you've been following the, the, uh, the channel, the Russo brothers were connected to possibly a Grimjack 
um, project. That might be dead in the water. Who knows? Pick this up for a dollar. Captain Adam 42. This is the first appearance of death in mainstream DC continuity. Um, there was a little bit of controversy because Neil Gaiman um, didn't know that they were going to do that. So he didn't approve of it. Also has this uh, great uh, homage to that incredible Hulk Starenko cover. Here's a book that I found. And I guess they pulled it out of another back, back issue box because either that or somehow... It got away from under the nose of uh, Joe from 360 Comics. And he had just uh, highlighted this book in a recent uh, show. This is X-Men 282, the first cameo appearance of Bishop, the second print. And this is the second print is scarcer than the first print. Um, so and we were actually talking about it afterwards. He goes, did it have rusty staples? Because there was one that had rusty staples that I didn't. I'm like, nope, the staples are fine. Um, so we'll take a closer look at this book, see uh, if it is... You know, how high a grade it is. Sandman coming up. Uh, picked up a pretty sharp copy of... Um, yeah, this is a really sharp copy. This 19... I think this is from 74? 73 or 74. Um, Simon Kirby. Sandman, number one. In the comics, this character does get connected to Mor the Morpheus character. Uh, we'll see if that happens in the TV show. It might not happen until a subsequent season. Um, and next up, this Doorway to Nightmare. I picked up a few copies of this. This is not as in high a grade of that. It does have some spine text. Just put this in a spec box. There's been talks about a Madame, du Madame Xanadu property. It's her first appearance. She's also a member of Justice League Dark. Uh, another character who's been a member of Justice League Dark um, at various incarnations and this is a, an I've um, highlighted this as an underappreciated DC key because this is from the 70s. It's a Bronze Age book. Um, pretty sharp first appearance of Shade the Changing Man. Uh, this was a Steve Ditko creation. And later on, he got a Vertigo ser series and they went, you know, in um, a very uh, interesting direction with the character. In more recent years, uh, he has been a member of Justice League Dark. I don't know if they do a TV or movie property. He will be included, but we'll put that in a spec box. Another book that I picked up quite a bit, and I was talking to a couple of um, folks at the show about this book, and then I went to the next booth and, and found one. Um, reasonably high grade. I don't think it's it's a 9.8. I'll have to see if, how nicely it could press. Um, but I thought the price was right. I think I got this for 15 bucks. Justice League 31, the first full appearance of Jessica Cruz. Um, Jessica Cruz uh, is one of the Green Lanterns. I don't think we've seen any casting for it, but there has been some indication that maybe she'll be one of the characters in the HBO Max series. Uh, the character really got hot when she was uh, uh, the lead Green Lantern in an animated um, movie uh, with the Fatal Five. And... Uh, She's also been, like, she's been used quite a bit recently. She was one of the DC superhero girls in the second incarnation of that uh, Cartoon Network short show. Uh, and Jessica Cruz was the Green Lantern, not a huge spoiler, but she was the Green Lantern in the League of Super Pets uh, movie that just came out. So that Friday, my kids really enjoyed it. It was fun. Kind of a fun little um, meta uh, end credit sequence there. So post credits. I don't know if it was... After, before the credits or after. It doesn't matter. Um, then I did, I picked up, I filled in, what do I have? Five books here to f um, fill in some gaps in my Justice League of America run. Um, I got some, I, I thought, higher grade copies. I'm kind of looking for fine or better. Number 52. All the Mike Sikowski, Gardner Fox stuff. 44. Forty-one. I think this brings me down maybe into the 30s, like 30-something 30 to the end that I have. This was a really sharp copy of 27. Very sharp. Look at that. Look at that. A couple little spine ticks, but for, you know, that early an issue, I'm getting to be a little bit of a quality snob with some of my JLA books. 
And this is also pretty sharp. There's a little bit of spine wear on this, but it's an even earlier issue. Got it for a nice price, number 18. So um, really happy. That was kind of what I spent a large part of the first part of my show looking for. Now, I did say I don't normally collect autographs. I make exceptions. They have to, it's not something that I'm, like this book is not going to be submitted either to CBCS or um, I didn't get it verified to go out to CGC. So um, I picked this up at the show um, because it did have a connection to my childhood. There were a couple of the celebrity um, guests that were there. Uh, from the 1974 Saturday morning TV show, Shazam. Uh, the actor who played Billy Batson on the show, Michael Gray. And the second actor to portray Captain Marvel on the show, John Davey. Um, and I was kind of inspired because as I was walking around, I saw a gentleman in a safari jacket. Now, if you're at all familiar, and you kind of have to be a certain age because it's not a show that really um, would have been seen by a lot of people uh, after its run on Saturday morning in the 70s. Uh, one of the characters in there uh, who took the sort of took the place of Uncle Dudley, and ac actually Uncle Dudley kind of took on that role in the comics when the show became popular enough, uh, it was a character called Mentor. So Mentor and Billy Batson would drive along the highways and byways of America um, trying to right wrongs in a Winnebago. And for whatever reason, Mentor wore a safari jacket. So I saw a guy in a safari jacket and he had a kid there like in a, a red shirt with yellow trim on the sleeves and the neck. I'm like, that's totally cool because I wore a safari jacket just like that to the Shazam premiere. Yes, judge me, judge me however you will. Um, and then when the movie Shazam came out, my daughter, who, what was she, like eight or nine at the time, we got a Mary Marvel costume on her, um, and like we had a an event where we went to for, for Halloween as a family, and I dressed up as Mentor, and she dressed up as Mary Marvel. It was kind of fun. So I went, and very, very uh, Gary was there. Uh, I dug through his box. I already have like half a dozen copies of these around the house, including a 9-8, but I just wanted this for my personal collection. Um, he gave me a nice deal on this Shazam number one. Pretty, pretty solid copy. And you can see there uh, at the top, it's signed by um, Michael Gray, who portrayed Billy Batson. And the bottom by John Davey, who portrayed Shazam. And I brought up to Michael Gray, it's kind of a fun trivia question. Um, what do Billy Batson and Spider-Man have in common? Now, Related to Michael Gray. Well, the answer is they both dated Marsha Brady. Because Michael Gray appeared on an episode of The Brady Bunch where he was dating Marsha. She was working in an ice cream shop and they broke up. Nicholas Hammond, the actor who portrayed Spider-Man in the late 70s TV series, also uh, was supposed to date Marsha. He was the big man on campus, asked her out, and then she got hit in the face with a football and her nose became all puffy and he had to tell her that something suddenly came up and he couldn't go with her. Um, but anyway, that's just a fun little piece of trivia. And Michael Gray had like a uh, publicity still of himself and Maureen McCormick um, from when he did the Brady Bunch episode. That was that was fun. Another huge piece of my childhood. I'm definitely dating myself there. Now, the last book that I picked up, and this is for me a grail. For most of you, you're like, what is that? Um it completes a run for me. Not a long run of comics, but a big run. And it's been a run that I've been working on for over 20 years. Uh, not, a, I didn't pick any of these books up in my childhood. Um, I didn't pick them up at conventions uh, when I was like in my teens. But when eBay came about, I was able to pick up some of the issues like in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then in the last, a couple of years I added and added and added and tracked them down and found them and so there was one issue I was missing that I needed to complete the run and at New York Comic Con I, I that's when I you know that's how far back I've been looking for this this one issue uh, there was a vendor there who had a lot of 
Golden Age books. This is a Golden Age run. And uh, I asked him if he had this particular book. He said, no, this run, he had the run, but he didn't have it with him. He had left it at home. So as I was walking through Terrificon, I recognized the vendor, saw a couple of books from the run that I already had on his wall and said, do you have Golden Age books? He said, yeah, and the box is over there, 20% off. I'm like, okay, cool. Found what I needed. And I wasn't, you know, 20% off. I wasn't even going to haggle. I was, the book um, is, you know, intact. It's in pretty good shape. Um, you know, the, so this was a 14-issue run um, from 1941 to 1944, I believe. And I needed just the 14th and final issue of Leading Comics. Now, Leading Comics was a book that included the seven soldiers of victory. If you watch the Stargirl TV series at all, that's those characters are in that series. Now, Stripesy, who's the stepfather of Stargirl in the comics on the TV series, um, played by Luke Wilson, is not on the cover here. He's the sidekick of Star Spangled Kid, who they refer to as Starman on the show. And he's played by, what is it? So Stripesy was the, it was kind of a reversal where the main hero was the Star Spangled Kid, who was the kid, and Stripesy, who was his chauffeur, was the sidekick. Um, and the Seven Soldiers of Victory came from five different features. There was the Vigilante, who was in Action Comics, Green Arrow, who along with Speedy, who was one of the other seven members, was in more fun comics. And of course, Green Arrow has uh, remained in publication to today. The Shining Knight was in Adventure Comics, and um, he, if you watch Stargirl series, we, we saw this character there. Um, Star Spangled Kid was in Star Spangled Comics with Stripesy, and then the Crimson Avenger was in Detective Comics. He was actually in Detective Comics, his first appearance is in issue 20, seven issues before Batman showed up. Um, and he had a sidekick wing. Originally, the, the Crimson Avenger was essentially um, a Green Hornet um, ripoff, for lack of a better term. Uh, didn't have a costume. Had like you know a cloak and a mask and a and a hat uh, and a uh, Chinese valet. So wing was his um, sidekick wing was the Cato of DC Comics. So this completes the run. I am so excited to have this book. There is a little rip at the top, but the staples look pretty solid. Uh, maybe a little bit of staining on the back. But again, for what this is, I've been wanting to complete this run for 20 years. Uh, if you've watched my previous videos, I'm a huge fan of The Seven Soldiers of Victory. The first comic that I really collected. I had gotten some comics along the way just about 50 years ago was Justice League of America 102, which is the third part of a team up between the Justice League and the Justice Society where they have to go back in time to um, on Earth 2 to retrieve the members of the Seven Soldiers of Victory. Now, um, this particular book, Leading Comics, the Seven Soldiers of Victory were kind of modeled after the... Um, Justice Society of America, but they took lesser features. And most of these, other than the Crimson Avenger, most of the other features premiered within months of the first issue of Leading Comics. Um, now, the Seven Soldiers of Victory, or Law's Legionnaires, as they were sometimes referred to, uh, premiered as a group in Leading Comics number one, and they were the only feature in the book through issue 14. 
After issue 14, um, The Seven Soldiers of Victory were dropped and it became a funny animal book. And it then became leading screen comics um, many issues after that. But these first 14 issues with The Seven Soldiers of Victory are what I've been focusing part of my collection on. And um, again, I was real i really love that story and it took me years 102 i got was the third part of the three-parter and um i didn't know um you know i didn't get the first the other two parts so i probably would have gotten that when i was like five years old i probably had to wait until i was 12 or 13 to go to a convention to track down the other issues uh justice league of america 100 and 101 uh, and then as an adult with some disposable income, I decided to go after this leading comics run. Uh, at some point, I'll do a video where I show all 14 books. Two of them are graded books. Uh, those two I've gotten recently. One uh, is, uh, I believe, likely a restored copy, which I'm fine with because it's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. So even if I were to get the books graded, they're not going anywhere. They're staying in my personal collection um, until... Uh, they get uh, passed on to my kids. I may upgrade those. The other part of the collection. So, like, you know, when you finish something that you've been collecting, you don't stop. You move on to something else. And I think for me, and this is aspirational, there were five features that the books came from, and I talked about them and the books they premiered in. I want to get the first appearances of each of those five characters. Now, the... Star Spangled Comics 1, reasonable. Um, the That's the first appearance of Star Spangled Kid and Stripesy. That is an affordable book. Um, you know, it's, it's an expensive book, but it's affordable. The rest of the books, uh, the first appearance of Vigilante is in Action Comics 42. It's an expensive book because it's an Action Comics, a Superman cover. Uh, it's from 1941. So it's it's a big book, but that is not um, overwhelming. The first appearance of The Shining Knight, and I have seen this book in person, didn't go for it. It was somewhat affordable. I'm talking about these books are probably in the hundreds of dollars. It was a little pricey because it was missing a chunk of the cover. Um, it's the first appearance of The Shining Knight is in Adventure Comics 66. Now, the, the two big ones, the two that'll be difficult. So three of the five will be, I think, somewhat attainable. But <laughs> now you can imagine the first appearance of Green Arrow is an expensive book. It's, it's more fun comics number 73. And it's the first appearance of Green Arrow and his sidekick Speedy also premiered in that issue. But for those of you who don't know, more fun comics 73 is also coincidentally the first appearance of Aquaman. So you have two of, I think, easily DC Comics' top 20 characters uh, premiering in the same book. Uh, I think the only other book that's probably true of would be Batman number one with Joker and Catwoman, and maybe Flash Comics number one with Flash and Hawkman, although obviously those characters have taken on different incarnations over the years. Um, that's... That more fun comics, even in lower grade, is thousands upon thousands of dollars. So that is aspirational. That's one of my, you know, I guess, ultimate grails. And, of course, these books, since they're from the early 1940s, um, are difficult to obtain. Now, the last book to collect is also one that's not as, as expensive, but maybe harder to find. And that's... Detective Comics number 20, as I mentioned, seven issues before Batman showed up was the first appearance of the Crimson Avenger. That is an uh, October 1938 book. Uh, you know, that's that's going to be a real fun book to try to track down. So um, that's the next step in my, my kind of collecting mania is to go after those five first appearances. And you can see, you know, there's other things that I'm collecting. The Justice League of America, trying to complete that run. I'm working my way down. And as you work your way down in a run from the highest numbers down to the lowest numbers, generally speaking, the books get more expensive because you get older, you get more keys. Um, also collecting a lot of DC. Uh, I want to collect all the DC 100 pagers. Picked up that Tarzan book and all the July 1976 with the Bicentennial banner on top. 
again, I have, I don't know how many different threads of things I'm trying to collect, you know, maybe a dozen or more, <laughs> not even including different runs that I'm trying to finish or, or flesh out. So that's what makes this hobby fun. Um, let me know in the comments below, what runs are you close to completing? Do you just need one or maybe two or three more issues to complete? Now, I know in more modern collecting, let's say silver bronze, there are runs that people try to put together. The first hundred issues of Spider-Man, let's say, or even the Ditko run on Spider-Man, the Kirby run on Fantastic Four, uh, books that ran for a shorter period of time like Submariner or Silver Surfer, where it's a limited number of books to get, but some of them are quite expensive. Let me know. What are you hunting that you're close to finishing? That's always kind of an interesting thing uh, to talk about amongst collectors. Again, since those are things that I'm trying to collect, I'm not going to be reselling them. Some of the books that I got, like in the $1 and $5 bins, um, I, I probably will uh, resell those, um, you know, put them up on whatnot and that sort of thing. So anyway, in the meantime, let me know what you think. Um in the comments and um, in the, also check out a couple of other videos that I've done recently. And this is Jim saying until next time, enjoy your comics.